Good afternoon from Washington, DC. My name is Lauren Risi, and together with my colleagues in the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program, our Brazil Institute, Polar Institute, and our Science and Technology Innovation Program, it's my privilege to welcome you to today's discussion on integrating indigenous traditional knowledge into climate change strategies. For those of you joining a Wilson Center event for the first time, a special welcome and a quick word about where you're tuning into. The Wilson Center is the living memorial to President Wilson. We were mandated by Congress to connect policy, practice, and research through nonpartisan, independent analysis, and open dialogue. Our program's expertise span every region of the world and today's most pressing issues. The program I direct, the Environmental Change and Security Program, works to connect issues at the intersection of environment, population, health, and security to foreign policy and development. Today, we are honored to be hosting three incredible panelists who exemplify leadership in the context of indigenous knowledge, but also leadership that is guiding transformative partnerships and decision-making at all levels, from the community on up to the international arena. As world leaders, government representatives, civil society, and industry meet in Glasgow this week and next for COP26, one thing is very clear. This kind of transformative leadership is critical to achieving the prosperous, healthy, clean, and peaceful future we all hope for. I'm gonna start by introducing our panelists and posing a few questions of my own before we open it up to questions from the audience. For those of you watching the webcast, you should see a box under the video where you can suggest questions for the discussion. Let's start with uh, Kat Brigham, is the chair of the board of trustees for the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation in Northeast Oregon. The tribes are a confederation of the Umatilla, Walla Walla, and Cayuse tribes. Chair Brigham has served as a leader on fish and wildlife issues since the 1970s and has been recognized for her work on negotiating agreements ranging from the Pacific Salmon Treaty to countless government to government negotiations with the states of Oregon and Washington to restore fisheries opportunities for tribal people and to protect tribal treaty fishing rights. Sonea Dovale is not with us yet, but she will be shortly. It's a busy time for all of these panelists today, and so she'll be jumping over very soon from another event, but I'll go ahead and introduce her here. Sineo Dovale is a Brazilian indigenous leader and environmental activist. She's a manager and coordinator of the environmental division of the Indigenous Council of Roraima and a member of the Climate Change Committee of the Coalition of Indigenous Peoples in Brazil. She's a recognized expert on matters relating to climate change mitigation and adaptation and the development of environmental and territorial management plans for indigenous lands. Sinea has represented Brazilian indigenous in national and international events and technical discussion for, a, for more than a decade, including at President Biden's climate summit earlier this year. And finally, Daly Sambodoro. Dr. Daly Sambodoro is the international chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council. She is the current Arctic region representative to the facilitative working group, the newest constituted body within the UNFCCC, which is comprised of both state party members and indigenous peoples from the seven sociocultural regions of the world. Dr. Daly holds a PhD in law from the University of British Columbia. I wanna thank each of you for carving out time uh, out of what I know is very full schedules to be here with us today. We have just an hour for this discussion. So my hope is that we're able to, at a minimum, plant some seeds that continue to grow. We had close to a thousand RSVPs to attend this event representing diverse perspectives and geographies. So there are at least that many opportunities for new ideas and initiatives to take shape. Uh, so let's go ahead and get to it. Um, Kat, I'm gonna start with you. You, uh, you, you know, you have all dedicated years to amplifying indigenous voices and decision-making from the local to national, regional and international levels. So let's take a minute to talk about the importance of integrating indigenous perspectives and knowledge into climate responses in particular. Can you talk to us about your efforts to help indigenous communities really lead on climate and, and what you hope to achieve? Uh, Kat, I'm turning it over to you. You're muted. <laughs> Okay, I'm very honored to be here today um, and to talk to so many people about climate change because it is, it is here and we are seeing things that have, we've never seen before. I mean, tribal people have learned to take care of our land because our land took care of us. We have a creation story that says, you know, our salmon, our big game, our roots, our berries and our medicines gave themselves to us. In response, we are uh, we are responsible for them to restore, protect, and 
keep them going because this is part of our culture, our history and our future. We have done a lot of things and I, I'm just gonna give you one quick example in, in the Umatilla Basin. Our river was it didn't have any salmon for 75 years. And in the very beginning, we thought, well, we can do this all by ourselves. And so we outplanted some fish and our smokes ended up in the, in the farmer's <laughs> fields. And so we realized that we couldn't do this alone. And so we started working with our local farmers, our states and our, federal, our Oregon and the federal agencies. And now we have irrigation screens across the irrigation diversions. We have salmon coming back to the Umatilla River that hadn't been there for 75 years. We've got spring chinook and coho. But this was done through collaboration and partnership. We worked hard to get there. And we let them know that they have a trust responsibility to the tribes. And by working to, to fulfill that trust responsibility to the tribes, it is not only benefiting the tribes, because Umatilla is not the only ones that are harvesting uh, the salmon on the Umatilla River. There are non-Indians who are looking forward to this season as well. So it benefits not only us, but the people within this region when they work to protect our treaty rights. Our treaty rights are very important. We push really hard to make sure our treaty rights are being protected and re rebuilding our natural resources, uh, for not only for today, but like I said, for future generations, our children's children. That's our responsibility as tribal leaders is look out and plan for the future. We have done a lot of work. Our, we have a first foods vision um, for the Umatilla tribe and we are applying that in the planning. We also have a river vision that is looked at and it's the how we work to protect our natural resources. So this work has been very important. But the other thing you mentioned, the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, uh, when this commission was first started in 1976, I think it was the Bonneville Power Administration approached the four tribes, the, the Yakima Nation of Washington, the Nez Perce tribe of Idaho, the Warm Springs tribe, and the Umatilla tribe of Oregon, and said, we, you should be at the table because we weren't. And they said, we sh you should be at the table in restoring the salmon runs in the Columbia River. And when they said that, they said we needed to have a central location for, to give you some money to assist to do this. And so the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission was formed. And that is now a very technical body that assists the, the Columbia River the four tribes in getting technical information to rebuild our salmon. They were very instrumental in the Pacific Salmon Treaty and now we're working on the Columbia River Treaty. Uh, that was uh, developed in 1964. And that treaty was done for uh, flood control and um, power. And now we're including ecosystem. And that paper was developed by the region in 2013. And now they're working on the Columbia River Treaty negotiations. But one of the problems we're having is they're not allowing the tribes at the table. And we think that the tribe's knowledge or technical people will be greatly assist in the negotiations for this Columbia River Treaty. We want a seat at the table. For the Walla Walla Basin, we are working, we actually dedicated a hatchery on the Walla Walla Basin last year and is in full operation this year. And so we'll be having salmon, spring chinook salmon coming back to the Walla Walla Basin. And that basin was 100 years without salmon. In 2010, we actually harvested three. So that was when the 100 years began. But now we're beginning to see, put a hatchery there that will rebuild naturally spawning fish. And so we're working to rebuild those, our natural stocks in the Walla Walla Basin. But we have one big hurdle that we need to overcome, and that's the nursery bridge. It's a bridge there that is not allowing enough flows for our salmon to pass. And we need to fix this bridge within four years. And we're hoping we will be able to do that. We've approached the federal agencies to let them know that they have a trust responsibility to the tribes and we want to move forward to do that. So we've done a lot of work. And I think that 
where it all began too was in 1969 when the U.S. v. Oregon, uh, United States versus Oregon case was um, made a decision. One, three of the decisions that was made was one, it uh, st said the tribes are entitled, tribal, the tribes are co-managers were entitled to a fair share of harvest and the states could not regulate us unless it was for conservation. And because of that, decision, we have uh, annually, or not annually, but we have up developed Columbia River Fish Management Plans in 1977, and we just ad adopted another one just a few years ago. So this is the on longest ongoing federal court case that we know of, and it's for the Columbia River Basin because we continue to update our management plan. And again, it's really important for tribal people to be at the table. We have a lot of knowledge. We have a lot of experience on how to protect and restore our natural resources. When we are brought in at the last minute, it slows the work down. So it's important that the tribes be at the table from the very beginning so we can help. We want to help. We want to protect our natural resources. We want to restore and enhance all of them because it's not only the tribes who benefit, it is the region. So these are all important issues for us and making sure we're there at the table to provide our knowledge and our experience and be a part of the solution, not part of the problem. Because if we are not part of the solution, we will be a part of the problem because it is not protecting our natural resources for our children's children. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Those were some really good examples. And I think um, the, the theme of partnerships and cooperation is one that is just rising steadily in the context of climate change and how the, you know we can't, we won't get anywhere without it. And speaking of cooperation, Daly, you are over in Glasgow for the COP, um, where we hope to see a lot of cooperation and collaboration. Um, you know, I think you've sort of also been working at all, all levels of decision making when it comes to uh, climate and environment. C can you sort of reflect on some of that experience and, and where you see where we are today based on where we've been and where you hope that we're going? Yeah, thank you for uh, the question and the opportunity to share my thoughts and perspectives on this. So live from Glasgow. <laughs> um, the Inuit Circumpolar Council, uh, for those that are unfamiliar, was organized in 1977. We represent approximately 180,000 Inuit throughout Chukotka, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland, as Lauren said in her introduction of me. We were present in 1992 in Brazil for the Conference on Environment and Development, which spawned the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And even at that time, we were seeing change. And um, our communities and the fact that uh, the vitality of hunting and harvesting continues to this day, it was active uh, in the 1990s. I mean, it's been active for centuries, right? We've adapted to this cold climate. But in 1992, when um, our leadership uh, attended the uh, Conference on Environment and Development. We were signaling to the rest of the world community that change is taking place and that climate change is already impacting the Arctic. So it's, uh, it's quite dramatic uh, in terms of what we've seen since that time. And the fact that we're now, as the Inuit Circumpolar Council present at COP26 and basically uh, reiterating the same message. But my estimation uh, presently at, at this meeting is that the, the world community finally gets it, right? The world community has, uh, on the basis of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports, as well as what we're all seeing with our own eyes, what we're all hearing, what we're all feeling, uh, it's climate change is not an if, it is when are we going to act in response to it. So the Inuit have uh, been paying close attention to this issue 
and has worked as an indigenous people's organization within not only the UNFCCC, but a whole host of other UN fora to ensure and influence the, uh, the dialogue so that it will eventually work in our favor. And that's our present hope right now. But um, I think that the, the, the messages that we're bringing is that this global crisis is going to impact our overall cultural integrity. I mean, there's no other way to say it. And the, and the simple meaning or the simple definition of integrity is something whole, something uh, undisturbed and whole. And this is really at the core of our concern about, uh, about climate change, the need for action, and the problems that we will feel if there is inaction. Thanks, Daly. That's a uh, really sort of powerful, the, the cultural integrity idea is it's very powerful. Art, do you, um, so I think it's really important to hear that there's been decades of engagement on this, right? And we've heard that from both of you. Daly, mm -hmm. does this COP feel different in terms of, I say, the broader community um, inviting and sort of elevating that engagement? Yes, it does. It does feel different. Um, I think that there is, uh, especially on uh, the part of the state party members, that the, the realization that uh, the entire globe expects action. And um, we, we've heard some really important pronouncements about action. The opening ceremony, uh, Patricia Espinoza, uh, the, the COP presidency, everyone has, has turned to this, this term that action is what is needed. And, and in my assessment, the, the, the efforts of states to meet 1.5 at a minimum, that, uh, and, and the action and the commitments that can be made toward that uh, will be one step. But in, it, in my view, we really should be shooting for something far more massive in terms of effort. But I think in answer to your question about whether or not it feels different, there is a different, um, a different milieu here, a different, uh, a different, um, set of emotions, but also um, hopefully, and we'll see uh, if there is a, a different uh, caliber of political will to respond to uh, what we are all facing. Thank you, Daly. So, you know, responding effectively to climate change is going to require a, a fairly significant shift in how decisions get made, um, including what kind of knowledge and information is brought to bear on those decisions. Um, Kat, we've seen in the U.S., the, the Biden administration has enhanced engagement with indigenous tribes on environmental related strategies and solutions. Um, we have Secretary Holland um, as, you know, making history as the first Native American to serve as a cabinet secret secretary in the U.S. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but I, I'm curious to know what this de increased demand signal means for you and your work. Um, and if you see opportunities to, to build the systems and the programs and policies to better integrate this knowledge uh, exchange across the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. All I see is that we've got people who are listening. And I think, you know, what Daylene was talking about, they're actually seeing people who are beginning to understand that there is a problem and that we all, we need to find a solution. Uh, with Secretary Holland there, I'm, we are very pleased because she knows what it means to live off the land. She knows how important our natural resources are. So with her there and uh, outreach from the uh, Biden administration to the tribes to listen to us more is a real turning point. I mean, before, as Lailene was talking about, people never paid any attention. 
And now people are beginning to say, we need to start working on this. I know one of the things that the tribes worked on is, you know, uh, a fish consumption rate for the state of Oregon. And the state of Oregon had a fish consumption rate of 17.5 grams of salmon per day. And we told them that was not acceptable. And they actually raised it to 175 grams per day. And now we're trying to get to Washington and, I and Idaho to do the same thing. But one of the things that was I keep in my mind is that the industry people were there of saying, you're going to impact my, my economy. But the question we asked is, what do you tell your children when they can't drink the water? We already have situations where um, drinking from the, the water is not safe. And so getting people to listen, getting people to or get organized, getting people to start looking at what do we need to do? And it's not gonna be, let's do this one year and it's done. It's going to be, have to be consistent management to protect our natural resources for our children's children, because that's who the tribes are fighting for. And that's who the United States is fighting for. When we have no clean air, when we have no clean water, where are we going? We have no place to go. So we have to protect our land, our natural resources for today, tomorrow, and all of our future generations. I want to be able to say when the grandchildren say, what did you do? Mm -hmm. I want to be able to say, we spoke up. We fought for your rights and your children's rights. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kat. Um, Daily, sort of going back to the question about Glasgow, but thinking more broadly than the COP, you know, I think um, if you want to reflect for a minute on what Kat just shared, but also um, this sort of knowledge exchange at the international levels um, and mm -hmm. and how you've found ways forward and where there are still sort of challenges that remain um, and what kinds of processes can be developed so that that kind of exchange is sustainable and ongoing and not sort of the hot thing for the moment. <laughs> right, right, right. Thank you for the question. Um, this this entire discussion about indigenous knowledge is, is crucial. And uh, first of all, allow me to share the fact that the ICC's preference is the term indigenous knowledge because our knowledge is not only based on our traditions and our ways of life and our profound relationship with the environment around us, but it has relevance presently today, and it'll have relevance well into the future. So uh, that too often the connotation is that traditional means something that happened uh, centuries ago, and certainly that's true, but we also have present knowledge. And in the context of climate change, things are changing and we're adapting to those changes so that the knowledge that we're accumulating and, and producing based upon that change is here and now. And of course, it's going to change well into the future. And uh, the Inuit Circumpolar Council has developed an actual definition of indigenous knowledge. And I encourage people, especially those in the area of research, um, many funded by the National Science Foundation to uh, seek out that information on our various different websites and in particular, the ICC Alaska office. Um, in, in regard to, uh, the advances, I think it's quite significant that individual authors of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, reports, especially in relation to the special report on oceans and the cryosphere, understand the need for the, the fair and just engagement of indigenous knowledge and indigenous knowledge holders. And in terms of challenges, that's not the standard for all other authors. We, we're still having to work to convince them that uh, we as Inuit, along the whole of the, of the coastal communities from Chikotka to Alaska to Canada to Greenland, have our 
eyes on the changes as they're happening. And honestly, the rate of change is now at such a pace that it's very difficult to adapt. But um, we're fortunate to have been able to influence um, reports that are coming out of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change through the use and the engagement of indigenous knowledge and indigenous knowledge knowledge holders. Um, other challenges uh, are the fact that um, few UN member states really understand, including in the context of the UN FCCC, the substantive and the procedural right of uh, self-determination in the context of indigenous knowledge. Uh, Article 31 of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples affirms our right to own, maintain, control, protect, and develop our knowledge and our knowledge systems. And this, this is a persistent challenge in, in a host of forum, not just uh, within the UN FCCC. And so this is a this is a continuing challenge for us. Um, it's also a challenge within the Arctic Council. The Inuit Circumpolar Council is uh, one of the uh, six permanent participants of the Arctic Council. We're engaged in four of the six working groups of the Arctic Council, and we we still meet challenges uh, in terms of the respect for and the recognition of the legitimacy, the validity of indigenous knowledge. Um, but I do want to say, uh, finally, in response to this question, that the recently released Status of Tribes and Climate Change report, in my view, exemplifies not only indigenous peoples driving the analysis about the impacts of climate change in this global crisis, but also it is in many ways, an expression of indigenous knowledge and that indigenous knowledge is embraced in this particular report. It also has relevance at the local level, at the regional level, at the national level, as well as the international level. Um, our organization has uh, made um, uh, steps to upload information like the stack report on the facilitated working groups uh, web portal, which was created by the UNFCCC and heavily influenced by uh, the ICC and other indigenous peoples. And here again, I would invite individuals interested in the work of the facilitated working group and climate change and indigenous people specifically to visit that particular web portal. Thank you, Daly. We can make sure to make that link available. Um, I think you know one of the challenges of of climate change is the the specificity of its impacts. They're very hard to anticipate, and so having that on the ground awareness and knowledge and and uh, um, sort of input into mm. all levels of the decision making is going to be really critical. Um, mm -hmm. Kat, do you want to take a minute to talk about some of the research that you have um, you and your your colleagues have produced to inform some of this work. Yeah, you know, in the beginning, you know, tribal peoples just depended on our knowledge of, of how to take care of the land and our natural resources. We didn't have the technical people to help us translate that into uh, um, something that the, that non Indians could understand, simply because. It was our way of life. And as we said before, you know, our traditional knowledge, knowledge is something that is passed down from generation to generation. And therefore, we just take care of the land. We had no technical way of saying, this is what you have to do. And I'm really proud to say Eric Quimps, who is our DNR director for the tribe, has developed a first foods concept paper. And he has been able to say, this is why you need to do this. It's it's consistent with our traditional foods, our knowledge, uh, and how we need to protect our natural resources. And you know, it lays out you know how our foods come about. I mean, we go for water, salmon, big game, fruits, and berries in our traditional or area order at our longhouse when we celebrate when our first foods come back. But it also ties 
to what how management needs to be changed. So it's very important that people recognize that we do now have some technical people who can assist us in explaining how things are going. I need to tell you another story. When the, when the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission first was established, we were at, in fish wars um, from the 80s to the 90s. We were fighting with the states and the feds and the non-Indians about why do we have to protect our treaty rights? And our biologist came up to us and said, we want to let you know our salmon is not there. So what do you want to do? And so we asked them, what do we need to do to protect our salmon? And they were just shocked because they thought we were going to say, let's go fishing. And instead, we pulled our fishermen off the river to try and started working on production plans to rebuild our salmon. So it's like I said, it's, it's about planning for future generations. And the other thing too is, you know, when we were doing the Pacific Salmon Treaty, we had technical people, key technical tribal people who were involved in that negotiations. They looked at the models, they looked at the technical information to protect the resources, not to make us available to harvest. We want to harvest, no doubt about it. We want to harvest our salmon. We want to harvest our deer, our roots, our berries, all of those things. But we want to do it in a way that is protected for future generations. Because like I said, well, again, we, are, we have to plan for our future generations. So we now have technical people who can help explain and can make that connection to our traditional law knowledge. I just want to add that. Thank you. Thanks, Kat. No, that's a really important example. Do you want to take a minute to, to explain the first foods concept? Oh. <laughs> Our first foods concept? Yep. Oh, wow. When the creator uh, created this, one of the things that, you know, he came down and, and said, oh, we have created tribal people. And so who is going to help them survive? Salmon stepped up first, then the big game, then our roots, our berries, and our medicines. And when they stepped up to, to help us survive, they also lost their voices. And so that's why we are responsible for protecting them, restoring them and enhancing them. And this is also the way we have celebrations annually for our salary, for our salmon, our roots, our huckleberries, our memorials, our namings. We have a lot of um, traditional events and our table is set up that way. So we have our water, our salmon, our big game, our roots, our berries, and again, our water, because water is important to all. And all of these things are linked together. So if you have a negative impact on one, you're, ha you're having a negative impact on all. So, and many times, you know, tribal people see that this is a circle of life not only for us, but for all of our foods, uh, for everything on the world, there's a circle of life. It's not a straight line that says we're gonna go this way. It's a circle of life for everything and all of it is connected. And that's why we celebrate our foods and uh, the way we do is because it's coming back to us. So it's our first foods and our traditional foods are very important. Um, each country, each region, a little bit of different traditional foods, but it is a part of our way of life. And like I said, our future, our culture, and our history. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Uh, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. I think, um, you know, there's this uh, been a growing body of research on climate change's impact on um, sort of you know, identity and um, mental health more broadly um, on trauma. We see how the stress of climate crisis, of the climate crisis is affecting people's lives, but also how it's putting immense pressure on how and, and stress on how they think about their future, especially for young people. I think that we've gotten some of those points across today. Um, I had a conversation recently with Jeremy Campbell at George Mason University who works with indigenous communities in Brazil. And he talked about how for 
those communities, this trauma related to environmental change and climate change is something that's, it's not new. Um, it's something that's been going on for centuries. So my question is uh, to you is, is, is there a way to integrate indigenous knowledge into climate responses that can also address in some ways this, um, what we might call accumulated trauma and the long legacies of colonialism? Um, Daly, why don't we start with you? I think that's a really important dimension that is often overlooked and um, the uh, ICC here at uh, COP26 held a side event and it was originally, it was originally um, conceived of as um, gaining the voices of young people on climate change and its impacts upon our infrastructure. And many may know that infrastructure across Inuit Nunat, across all of our homelands is essentially substandard. And we wanted to hear from youth about uh, their, their views and their perspectives. What are they actually seeing in terms of uh, climate change and its impacts upon infrastructure? And I have to say that each of these individuals were brilliant in terms of their responses and not prompted by a single question. Uh, one of the youth um, indicated that, that for themselves as a hunter uh, who's actively hunting every day, um, but seeing the changes, what is it gonna be like 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 40 years from now, 50 years from now? and the knowledge uh, that they have, how are they gonna transmit it if things are changing so quickly? And really came to the conclusion that yeah, that's really terrifying and, and creates uncertainty and um, you know, starts uh, uh, or triggers some of these more inward questions about, about their identity, their, their behavior, their activity, their relations with others in community. And um, it is not an easy matter to confront in any way. But the upside of it was that um, they can take action. They can raise their voices and offer what they are seeing what they are learning, what they have learned, uh, and what they're already sharing with uh, younger people. Some of them have uh, children of their own now. What, what their responsibility is for, for sharing that information. And um, it's that intergenerational dimension of indigenous knowledge. And and to use their voices, not only at the micro level with their own families and their own communities, but also at the national level and the international level to ensure that these connections are understood in terms of their own health and wellness as, as an individual Inuk, but all of us collectively as the Inuit. So I thought it was a, a really, really well articulated way of understanding the, the multiple dimensions of um, impacts that climate change is having. I mean, they, 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 are, um, they are economic, they're social, they're cultural, they're spiritual, but they also uh, dramatically impact health and wellness. And that's not even uh, getting into the issue of food security. Well, it sort of is because he was a hunter and he's very keen, you know, to ensure food security uh, for his family and community. But, but um, I guess in the sense of nutrients and, and, and ensuring that, that not only climate change, but all these other uh, adverse impacts that are uh, have been emerging in the Arctic aren't uh, completely threatening uh, the way of life of, of Inuit as hunters and, and harvesters. So, uh, and, and that was just one of the responses to questions that were being posed. But these, these young people were really, really um, very articulate and, and just brilliant. I, 
I have hope for the future just based on that short 90 minute side event. Thank you, Daly. Kat, did you want to weigh in? Oh, oh wow. Well, yeah. Yes, I do. I think, you know, our youth, uh, if there are, I mean, we've said it many, many times, our youth are our future leaders. And if our youth don't know about our traditions and our culture, then our treaty rights is then questionable. I know I, I've got a story where um, a man talked about uh, us rebuilding salmon on the Uvatala River. Uh, he said, wow, I can teach my grandson how to fish on the Umatella River. I wasn't able to do this with my son, but I am able to do it with my grandson. And so passing on that traditional logic is very important so that they learn and they also can work to protect that knowledge. Getting our youth, um, we have a number of youth who are who are very aware of our traditional law, our traditional cultures and, and events and participate, but we have some that aren't. And, and because they're not aware of all of these things, they turn to a different way of life. And it is very troublesome that when they do, but, but at the same time, we're also hoping that they come back and understand, you know, our culture, our tradition, and our future is them. And therefore, we have we need to keep, to keep continue to teach them our tribal knowledge. I um, have another story where um, when we were doing the fish forest, my grand, my daughter came up to me and she said, "Why aren't we fishing?" And I said, "We have no fish." And she said, "Are we going to be able to fish when we grow up?" And then I told her, "That's what we're fighting for." is to have our traditional fisheries. And yes, the main stem is important, but our tributaries are also important. Our whole basin is important when we're looking at rebuilding our salmon. So getting our youth involved to participate is very important because again, they are our future leaders and they need to continue to protect our treaty rights. And when they do that, they are not only protecting our future, but they're protecting the regional future as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. We have a lot of uh, questions that have come in and I'm gonna get to them in just a minute, but I have one more of my own um, that I think is an important one. So the, the Biden administration uh, just a couple of weeks ago released its gender strategy. Uh, which incorporates climate issues um, throughout. And in particular, the strategy mentions empowering people of all genders as leaders and incorporating indigenous and traditional knowledge into climate strategies and the need to elevate women in climate negotiations and climate science. Given that you are both women leaders in this space, I'd be interested to get your take on how gender dynamics are incorporated or not into decision-making that's informed by uh, indigenous perspectives. Uh, Daly, why don't we start with you? Sorry, you got to unmute. I wish I could do it for you. Sorry about that. Uh, I think that um, it's important to understand, at least within our communities, that that the whole community, um, that everyone in the community is an indigenous knowledge holder, and that the that the younger people and the intergenerational dimension of indigenous knowledge is it. it it has to be um, has to be uh, valued and, and understood. It's held collectively by all of us within our communities, and it that's reflected in the definition that we've adopted uh, for the term indigenous knowledge. So, but clearly, Inuit women hold distinct knowledge, and uh, based upon. Um, the, the the protocol and the values, the, the the tasks that they undertake in relation to what is harvested and and brought in, um, but at the same time, again, uh, the, this knowledge is is collectively held, and so it, it 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 at least from my perspective may not be shared by all Inuit women, but. But that this is um, this is an area that 
recognizes the 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 balance of the the roles and the tasks and the and the protocols that are undertaken within our communities and certainly many uh, Inuit women are making contributions um, through our work nearly in every area that we work in and that's we have many carry uh, in terms of our international engagement um, and I suppose uh, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that our worldviews and perspectives and relationships uh, within community fall neatly into the the gender um, or a way really the way the question was posed and and uh, just want to reiterate that it it's it's knowledge that's held collectively, and we're fortunate that there are many women in leadership roles that are that are advocating. In fact, I think the 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 delegation that we have here it's certainly a majority um, of women um, doing doing work in a, a host of different areas. But um, I'll just close by also saying that when it comes to the use of indigenous knowledge and um, research activities and other activities uh, that all of these matters, uh, whatever they, they, the design of research or the question being posed, especially by Western scientists and others, that every element of uh, research that may be undertaken that uses indigenous knowledge is relevant to, to Inuit. And, so it's really hard to kind of put this neatly into a a, a gender framework. Um, I I hope that makes sense. It absolutely makes sense. Thank you. And you're right. It is hard. <laughs> uh, Kat, over to you. Oh, I think it is great. I mean, so many times uh, our women, and I I was included in that. I don't have anything to say. Um, I don't think what I have to say is important, but I do know I have a role. Uh, and so when we encourage the women to speak up, we encourage them to get involved. We are looking at the big picture because so many times we've said, you know, it includes everyone. Everyone is part of our solution. Um, but, but when we tend to just say, oh, we're gonna listen to the men, well, we kind of forget about the women, and the women do have a lot of knowledge to share. And in many instances, you know, the women were behind the scenes, but at the same time, they were there sharing their knowledge with the men to show so that they can move forward. So I think it is really great that the, the Biden administration is recognizing that the women do have knowledge, they do have something to, to share, and they are part of the solution because all of us are part of the solution and we need to be working together to do to develop that collaborative approach for our future generations. Thank you. Thanks, Kat. Uh, I'm going to ask a couple of the questions from the audience now. One is from uh, Dick Lefevre. I'm sorry if I'm not saying that right, a member of the Northern Cheyenne tribe. Um, he says, talk about the tension, at least from my perspective and experience, with Native communities over the extraction of natural resources, such as coal, oil, minerals, timber, and other renewable and non-renewable resources. And I thought I might um, adapt that question a little bit to think about the responses to climate change and how, you know, this shift to renewable energy economy is going to require more extraction of uh, critical minerals and resources and how you're thinking about this and um, working with different parties to ensure that in our responses, we don't unintentionally create additional challenges or environmental risks uh, or social or cultural risks as well. Um, Daly, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, I think um, checking to see if I was unmuted. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that um, one of the things that we have learned from our, our Sami colleagues uh, 
And many may know that the United Nations, uh, in terms of Indigenous peoples, organizes around seven sociocultural regions, including the Arctic, and that the Arctic is comprised of Inuit and Sami. And so we work very, very closely with them. And um, they uh, reviewed a statement that I prepared uh, in the dialogue that we were holding with the COP presidents the yesterday afternoon. And uh, wanted to ensure that uh, for them, windmills and all of the proposals for green energy as an alternative um, and, and, and something that goes to uh, making a difference in terms of climate change has been um, not such a good idea for them uh, as, as reindeer herders. And they, they simply wanted to indicate that, that um, and this is where indigenous knowledge is also relevant, that, that proposals for green energy, these too have to engage indigenous peoples and indigenous knowledge and uh, the impacts upon um, the, the traditional economic activities as well as the communities of indigenous peoples. So I thought that was a really interesting interesting um, dynamic and they've been they've been fighting this and pretty successfully uh, including a recent court case I think just two weeks ago on um, the the fact that uh, those that installed all of these uh, wind turbines in uh, Sami territory um, uh, put a, a stop to it and now trying to figure out okay what's the what's the next step? But the, the other dynamic that I want to share is that for the most part, and this was said by one of our youth in the session today, much of the impacts and the adverse impacts of climate change that have arrived in the Arctic by virtue of air currents, ocean currents, uh, have been generated by activity, economic activity driven far to the south of us. I mean, we don't even know where um, where all of the sources in terms of the, the the rapid impacts that we're seeing now. And we have urged sustainable development um, and, and finding that balance because we too need uh, economic development. We need economic activity. I mean, it can be, uh, it's revealed in many, many different forms. For example, um, the concern about heavy fuel oil in the Arctic region because of increased shipping triggered by climate change. You know, our communities rely upon uh, barge service there are no roads. Yes, we can we can use uh, we can use um, air cargo delivery and everything, but uh, some essential services or provisions need to be provided um, by by ship, and um, you know it's it, it's created a a dynamic where we have to raise our voices in terms of what is the best way forward um, to overcome potential impacts of heavy fuel oil, even though we're dependent upon the service as it exists today. And so we wanna to contribute to, to ensuring that any further research and development and, and change out of things like heavy fuel oil take us into account. I mean, if there were a sudden immediate ban, for example, in HFOs, uh, we probably wouldn't have the goods and services that are provided by, by the barges. And that's just a, a, another example of how, how interconnected everything is today. And, uh, but also it underscores, um, or at least I, I think it's important for everyone to take into account the, the, the impacts that we're feeling and seeing and have been experiencing uh, for decades um, are largely driven by uh, much larger economic forces far from our homelands. And, uh, you know, it makes us wonder sometimes, do these, do these powerful economic forces really understand the, the, the basic definition of sustainable? Uh, and I'll, I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you, Daly. Kat? Well, 
First of all, I'm going to say that the tribes are not against economic development at all because we understand that, you know, we need to have economic development um, to enable in order to survive. But we want the economic development to be done in a way that is not impacting our natural resources. And I'm going to, and, and I know this is far different from timber and coal and everything, but I will give you an example. During the fish wars, one of the questions that we asked the states is, why do you start fisheries on Memorial weekend and end them on late Labor Day weekend? And the response was, because that's when people want to go fishing. It was not because that's when the fish are there. It's because that's when they want to go fishing. And because of that, we, we ended up going to court several times. And, and we finally got the ocean management fisheries based upon uh, um, indicator stocks so that you know they know that these fish are there and available to harvest. And so it, it took change. And so it's got you gotta be open-minded. You gotta be able to say, all right, what can I do? What needs to be done? so that I can continue to, to operate, but still protect our natural resources. Because without that change, without being open-minded to see what, what can be done, then we are going to be fighting each other rather than working with each other. And it takes a lot, and I know it, <laughs> it takes a lot to start looking at what needs to happen. But if we don't start looking at what our future is going to look like, we are not going to be in a very good situation at all. We're already feeling it. I mean, right, I mean we have uh, things that are just not happening normally anymore, and we need to be aware of that, and we need to start looking at how can we make things different. Thank you, Kat. Can I ask you both, do you have, if we go over by three minutes, is that okay? <laughs> You have a hard stop. Okay. All right. Because there's like two more questions that I want to ask. And then I have my final question and I don't want to intrude on your time, but I think these are important. <laughs> um, so one of the questions is from Jeremy Campbell at uh, a, a researcher at George Mason University. He says, could you share your thoughts on whether and how indigenous peoples are able to access finance, finance for climate justice, environmental services, and for, forest guardianship, especially in the context of current agreements being negotiated at COP? And uh, Daly, why don't we start with you? Well, this is a this is actually a pretty delicate question in the context of the UNFCCC, uh, largely because of this, in my assessment, and from an indigenous perspective, the false dichotomy between the developed and the developing world, um, the fact that uh, approximately forty four of our communities in Alaska don't have potable water and sanitation services, yet we live in the most affluent country on earth or one of the most affluent countries on earth is it is really the rationale for my statement that that there is a false dichotomy for indigenous peoples in the so-called developed world and and you know we have these various different categories like the small island developing states and and others and and i think people understand that this, this dichotomy in, in our particular context uh, doesn't work. The Green Climate Fund is, is an example. Uh, because, uh, because we are in the so-called global north, and I, I really don't like any of these terms, we can't access uh, those funds to do the kinds of things that are necessary in terms of uh, responding to climate change. In terms of the, the massive efforts that are needed as far as adaptation and mitigation by tribal communities across the United States and by Inuit, uh, Inuit across the circumpolar Arctic, you know, the, the question of finance is, is crucial. Some of the announcements that have been made um, the recent announcement by the, the philanthropic communities to uh, devote a substantial amount of resources to indigenous peoples specifically and explicitly is helpful, yet in my view it is up to uh, the, the state party members of the UNFCCC to understand 
the impacts upon indigenous peoples specifically. And uh, these matters are, are linked to not only the fact that we hold within indigenous territories across the globe, 80% of the world's biodiversity, and we are the, we're the guardians of, of this biodiversity. And our knowledge is linked intimately with, uh, with, with the biodiversity that surrounds us. So um, the, these questions and, and the ability for those in the decision-making rooms in the blue zone here at COP26 uh, need to recognize that they have to have uh, the best available knowledge to make decisions. And that means kind of clearing the lines between the so-called developed and developing world in the indigenous context and ensure that such finance is equitable and terms of its access and that the processes by which we can access them are not onerous. Um, and, you know, I mean, there, there are so many little moving parts in relation to this question of finance, but I think my main message is that, uh, that the world community needs to dispense with these, these categories in relation to Indigenous peoples. Thank you, Daly. Kat? Um, having um, tribal access to funding is very important. Um, and I think, you know, we don't want to go to the states. We want to have the federal government or the organizations provide the funding directly to the tribes. But I also think it's important for us to um, recognize that, you know, not one funding source is the answer. Not mm -hmm. one entity is the answer. And I'm, again, I'm going to use the example that the Uintala tribe has done in that's up region three. The Union Pacific Railroad came through our reservation and they put several dikes up to put the creek against the hill. So the, the our region creek went straight down the hill. And then our tribe developed a uh, collaborative approach or in, in, to rebuild our region creek to be a, a Miranda stream again. And there, I think there was 14 funding sources. So it was a collaborative partnership approach that brought in many different funding sources, many different volunteers to say, we're gonna rebuild this stream. And when we did that, uh, one of the things that we did see right away was springs showing up that were not there before. And so there, there's a lot of things that we can do, but Making sure that the tribes get the funding is very important, but also recognizing that it's not just one funding source that is going to be the solution. It's going to take a collaborative approach to say, how can we find this solution and make it work? Go to the implementation of rebuilding and restoring and protecting our natural resources. Yeah. Go ahead, Daly. Yeah, Lauren, thanks. I, I just, um, um, the, the question that you posed was in the context of, a, of the um, negotiations here within the COP, but the other dimension to this is the importance of Inuit communities being self-reliant and, and uh, self-sufficient. And there, there are so many different hurdles that um, are in the way of us being self-sufficient and self-reliant so that we can tackle, so that we have the governance structures, that we have the, all the mechanisms that allow us to manage our resources in a sustainable fashion to respond to climate change, you know, all of these different elements. And that's, that's another important part of this whole question of finance, because, you know, we're not, we're not, demanding some kind of a handout. Uh, there is a measure of responsibility on the part of governments, but there's also a measure of responsibility uh, for them to honor their obligations in terms of upholding our rights and our role as distinct indigenous peoples with pre-existing or inherent rights to do so. And uh, I mean, that, 
that is really the the target that is really the objective i'd like to add to support that because that we wouldn't be in a situation if we had um taken care of our natural resources and tribes are a nation within a nation and they need to be treated as a nation within a nation we are sovereign governments and therefore we are not looking up for handouts we are looking up for states and federal agencies and everybody to live up to their trust responsibility in taking care of the natural resources for our future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Daly. Um, okay, one more question, if you don't mind, and then um, and then I'll say thank you. Um, I think this is, there's been a couple questions related to this, so that's why I want to bring it up in particular. Uh, it's from David Ogier. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, David. Uh, what advice would you give to scientists and analysts looking to effectively co-develop projects with indigenous communities using both indigenous knowledge and current science for development and adaptation projects? So how can the scientific community most effectively work with indigenous communities? Yeah, that's that. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would just say start working with this from the very beginning. I mean, mm -hmm. we have knowledge that we want to uh, share and, and, and work with you. Uh, and if you start with this, I mean, just outreach to tribes. I don't know how many times I've heard we didn't know how to, who to contact. Um, but at the same time, not, I mean, we're on the website. We're in the phone book. I mean, and therefore, yeah. it's sometimes it's as simple as an email, simple as a phone call to say, we want to work with you. But it, it's also important to develop that relationship. I mean, because if we know we're going to be moving forward to protect our natural resources and working with scientists to help us explain our, why our, natural, our indigenous knowledge is so important, you have to develop that relationship so then we can trust you and share that information more because um, if we don't trust you and you're going to use and abuse us then you're wasting our time and yours but you know we want to move forward we want to be able to to work with and help scientists understand but you have to develop that relationship you have to start working with us early so that we can work together Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and further to that, I think that if if there are researchers out there, and and the whole objective of research, right, is the production of knowledge, I would suggest doing some work to produce some knowledge about who we are, even before you pick up the phone book, um, and who we are where we live, um, we have we have a, an extraordinary pool of resources. We're fortunate now to have the internet uh, where organizations like the Inuit Circumpolar Council post uh, uh, our materials, our project reports, our activities. Um, I mean, there's just volumes of information that can be found well before you well before you send that email. But when you do send the email, uh, we'll also have resources to be uh, responsive. Um, I mean, outreach, uh, the, the Inuit Circumpolar Council is easy to find on the internet, but uh, I want to just uh, conclude by saying that we're presently in the process of preparing what is referred to as ethical and equitable engagement of indigenous knowledge protocols and guidelines. And, and it goes to what I was saying earlier about the substantive elements of uh, the right to indigenous knowledge, but the procedural elements, uh, just as Kat has said, you know, engage us from the beginning. I mean, if you if you show up with an idea as a researcher that makes absolutely no sense, um, you know, for example, wanting to study caribou when they're thousands of miles away from the community, which they might be, uh, then we're going to say, well, you know, we got some information and knowledge about that. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, uh, and it really is about, as Kat has said, behavior, 
right? Just social behavior and social learning and um, that important element of trust. And it, and it really also comes down to, to respect for uh, who we are, our identity and what we have to offer and recognize it in an honorable way uh, throughout every stage of a research uh, uh, process, you know, every phase. Um, at, there, there's so much I could say about this. We're about to conclude the initial report of this triple E project, Ethical and Equitable Engagement of Indigenous Knowledge. Uh, as a as a tool for researchers and and for scientists, the, I, I suppose it's important also to underscore that that we are keen to co-produce knowledge because in our estimation, policy and decision makers, especially all those people across the river at the COP twenty six, they need to have the best available knowledge to make decisions that are going to be favorable for all of humanity, not just Inuit, not just Umatilla, but all of us. Um, so it, it, we, we have lots of guidelines. Some of them are unwritten, but we're going to make an effort to put them in black and white so people, people, people um, uh, know how we want them to behave when they enter our community and, and our realm. Yeah. Thank you, Daly. Thank you, Kat. That's really wonderful. I think, you know, there's been a few questions that have come in about where to access some of this information. So we'll follow up with you afterwards to make sure that we include that in the summary of the event and links to relevant material and, and keep an eye out for that report, Daly. Um, thank you very much for your time in what I know is a very busy time um, and for and for contributing to this discussion. I'm sorry that Sanea wasn't able to join us, but we will follow up with her <laughs> at another point. This is, you know, this is a, a, an ongoing discussion, and so there'll definitely be future opportunities. I've learned a lot from both of you and really look forward to engaging further. Uh, for those of you who are tuning in, let me quickly flag a couple of opportunities this week to engage further on Indigenous knowledge and climate action. At the U.S. Center at COP26, Secretary Holland will host a discussion with Indigenous youth on November 5th. And on November 6th, uh, Secretary Holland and USAID Administrator Samantha Power will co-host a discussion titled Saving Nature to Save Ourselves, which will be focused on nature-based and Indigenous-led solutions. Uh, the U.S. Center is live streaming all of its events, so you should be able to catch those online. To those of you who tuned in, thank you very much for being part of the discussion, for your great questions. Thank you to my Wilson Center colleagues in the Brazil Institute, Polar Institute, and Science and Technology, Technology Innovation Program for co-sponsoring today's event, and to Treyon and Tracy on our AV team for making sure that you could hear and see us. Uh, the recording of today's event will be available on the Wilson Center event page in the next day or so, and we will be producing a summary of the event for our blog, New Security Beat, where you will be able to find a lot of the links, uh, links to materials referenced in today's discussion. Thank you again very much. Thanks for taking Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye.